63. It's good to see all of our visitors here. We appreciate your being here. Some that used to be here regularly, some passing through. Someone asked Ryan and Emily when they were moving down back down here. Uh, we hope that uh, soon, but uh, they didn't. They were kind of non-committal about that. But uh, it is good to see all of our visitors. We have at our house a couple passing through, Karen's sister and her husband. So. And there's a few others I see as well. We appreciate all of you being here. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, I'm going to be traveling uh, Saturday, uh, going up to Kentucky, uh, be holding a meeting where Paul Vaughn is preaching in that congregation. Uh, and Paul Brantley said that he's going to be going with me. So. Some uh, preachers, they don't let out of town without an escort, and uh, maybe I'm getting that way. <laughs> Sometimes we need it too. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we appreciate the prayers for safety on our behalf as well, and the success of the meeting there. In Galatians, the second chapter, in verse 21, Paul writes, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness can't come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. There is the very real possibility that Paul sets before us, even though it might seem unusual to us in thinking about it, but that Christ died in vain. And when we consider that here's the Son of God, God manifested in the flesh, and that He is the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament prophecies, and in those prophecies, it was prophesied that He would not only come to this world, live among us, and live a sinless life, but that He would also be taken and crucified, placed on a tree, and thus die in that terrible death. And thus when Jesus does that, to think back now and think that His death was in vain seems rather odd. And yet that is what Paul is revealing to us in this text. That it is possible that his death being in vain. And he speaks specifically here that there's that possibility of his death being in vain if righteousness comes by the law. Or if the law of Moses is still binding upon us then Christ died in vain. We looked at that last week in a little bit more detail, but we see it here that if we could be saved, if we could be made righteous by the law of Moses, then there's no reason for Christ to die. And thus his death would have been in vain. This morning I want us to look at a few other aspects that if the doctrine of predestination, as is generally taught by man, is correct. Then Christ died in vain. Now, understand when I made that statement, the aspect as generally taught by man. Because predestination is taught within the Scriptures. But we're dealing with a doctrine that man teaches or has perverted in relationship to predestination. 
This doctrine, uh, first, uh, as far as my knowledge, was advocated by Augustine, but then it was refined and made popular by Calvin, John Calvin, during the Reformation. And it basically said, there's different aspects, but the idea of predestination specifically dealt with the aspect that God, before the creation of the world, he had made a decision as to who he would save and who would be lost. But that this decision was on an individual basis. In other words, using myself as an illustration, God, even before he created the world, determined that Michael Hatcher would be born in 1900 and none of your business. And I think most of y'all already know anyway. But that Michael Hatcher would either be, and this based upon God's decision, he would either be lost, or he made the decision, Michael Hatcher would be damned and sent to hell. And that there's nothing that I can do about it. God made that determination, and in that they talk about God's sovereign will, as if God's sovereign will is of such a nature that it does not allow man free moral choice. And thus, man is predestined to either heaven or he is predestined to hell. Now, they don't usually like to talk about the predestination to hell too much. They just want to talk about the predestined to heaven. Of course, uh, I can understand why. When you start realizing, you mean that God determined that this individual is going to be, that he's going to send this individual to hell and there's nothing that that individual can do about it? That's really what they believe. That's the idea of predestination as is taught by man. That here is a man that God has predestined to hell. There's nothing he can do about it. He may want to be saved. He may want to do God's will. He may have the desire to go to heaven. Too bad. You can't. God determined you're going to hell and there's no way to change it. And here's this other individual over here who God had to, has determined he's going to take that individual to heaven. And that individual may not want to go to heaven. He may not want to do what God wants him to do. He may want to live an ungodly life, an unrighteous life, and do all these evil deeds within his life, but it doesn't make any difference what he wants. That individual is going to heaven whether he wants to or not. Why? Because God determined it way back here before he created the world. Now that's the idea that John Calvin presented to, a, to the world. And sadly, the majority of the religious world falls right in line with that doctrine. They believe that doctrine. And they'll talk about the sovereign grace of God and His sovereign will. When you hear that aspect or those terms, you can almost be assured they're talking about the idea of God predestining individuals. Some of them go to the great extreme, not all of them, but many of them will go to the extreme that every action that you take, every word that you speak, God determined before the world began that you would say the, that word or that you would do that action. Now then, what does that place God in? Anything that you do that is wrong or sinful why, I guess what? You're not responsible anymore for it. You could not help it. Instead of, as Flip Wilson put, I think, popularized it years ago, the devil made me do it. It wasn't the devil, it was God that made you do it. If you go out and murder someone, it's God who made you do that. If you rape and pillage uh, people, it's God who made you do that. God determined before the world that you were going to do it. There's nothing you can do about it. You're not responsible for it because God forced you to do it. 
one individual said that that God of Calvin is the most ungodly, unworthy individual to be worshipped that anyone can think of. He is an abomination. That God. Understand, if the doctrine of predestination as taught by Calvin and that as taught by man today is correct, then why did Christ die? There wasn't any need for it. Those individuals that God determined before the world began that they were going to heaven, they're going to heaven no matter what. There was no need for Christ to die. Why did He die for those individuals? They're going to heaven whether they want to or not. It was foolishness for Christ to die if this doctrine of predestination is, is correct. Now then, we should, and I'll add that predestination is taught in the Bible, for example, in Romans the 8th and the 9th chapters, Romans the 11th chapter, Ephesians the 1st chapter, 1 Peter the 1st chapter. But it is a far cry from what the doctrine of predestination is taught by man is set forth. The doctrine of predestination as taught in the Scriptures is that God planned a plan to save mankind. He set forth those things that were necessary to save man from his sins it relies upon man's actions that man has to be obedient to that will of God in order for him to be saved. And those individuals then who are obedient to God's will, God made the determination, if you do these things, you'll go to heaven. If you don't do these things, then you'll go to heaven. Now that is the idea of predestination as it's taught within God's Word. It is a predestination of a place, a location where salvation is. That salvation will be in Christ. And thus we read 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10 of that very thing that we are saved in Christ. There's the location. If you're in that location, you're going to be saved. You've been predestined to salvation if you're in that location. If you're not in that location, then you've been predestined to hell. Yes. Why? Because you're not in the right location. But it's your responsibility to get in that location as it is all men. We do that through obedience of the gospel of Christ. And thus, it is true, Christ died for all. Hebrews 2 and verse 9 Paul would write that we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that He by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Calvinism, in order to avoid this problem that they saw that Christ's death would be worthless if their predestination of those individuals to hell is true, so they came up with another doctrine called limited atonement, that Christ didn't die for everybody. He only died for those that God had predetermined to save. Why did He need to die for those individuals, though, if they were already going to be saved? But they came up with this idea of a limited atonement. Christ only died for that certain group, not for everyone. The Scriptures show that Christ died for all men. Everyone has that opportunity to obey the gospel and be saved, to be found in that location that has been predestined by God to eternal life. And thus, John would write in 1 John 2, verses 1 and verse 2, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He is a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Yes, Christ died for everyone. And it's our responsibility to obey that gospel of Christ so that we can be found in Him. 
and thus be saved. But if the idea of predestination as taught by man today, generally taught by man today, is right, there was no reason for Christ to die. His death would be and is thus in vain. But then also, if there is no res future resurrection from the dead, then Christ died in vain. There have ever been those who have denied the resurrection. In Matthew, the 22nd chapter, it says in verse 23 that the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. Here is a group of individuals, a sect of Judaism, that said there's no resurrection. They denied it. And they presented Jesus an argument they thought that would solve the problem as to a resurrection. In their mind, proving that there was no resurrection. We're not going to get into that problem that they presented this morning. But I have no doubts that they had asked this many times of those who believed in a resurrection and they were kind of, I don't know the answer. But of course Jesus did. Because there was, would be a resurrection, a future resurrection. But there is individuals who did not believe in a resurrection. In Corinth, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, this great chapter on the resurrection, he writes in verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some of you, or some among you, that there is no resurrection of the dead? So here at Corinth, they had individuals who were teaching this very doctrine. There is no resurrection from the dead. And even in the Lord's church, you saw that taking place. In 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 17 and verse 18, Paul talks about that their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. And they overthrow the faith of some. So here's two individuals, those who are making inroads in the church, who are saying, Resurrection's already taken place. We have some in the church of our Lord today who are teaching the same thing. They're called the Max King or the Kingites, followers of Max King, who several years ago wrote a book in which was a rehash of a doctrine. It's called the Doctrine of Realized Eschatology. Now that's a real big word. Two words. Eschatology is very simply a study of last things. And then you have realized. In other words, all the doctrine of the last things, all doctrines of the last things have already been realized. In other words, they've already taken place. So, final judgment, heaven, hell, resurrection, all that's already taken place. I have asked them before, well, are you in heaven or in, he or in hell? And which am I? And they didn't answer the question. <laughs> because if they're in heaven and I'm not, then what's the difference? And if I'm in heaven and they're not, then what's the difference? What difference will there be? But we have those today who are teaching that doctrine. And they have split many congregations in the Lord's church because of this doctrine. We have the modernists of today who basically deny the resurrection. They can look at just this world they're materialistic in their outlook, looking at just the material aspect of Christianity. In other words, there is no, there were no miracles that took place. There was no real, true resurrection from the dead that Jesus bodily rose from the dead. 
They would talk about a resurrection, but their resurrection is not a physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus. It's hard to make a distinction when they say, yes, there's a resurrection, and they're not talking about that. Their idea of the resurrection is a resurrection of a thought. The resurrection of the ideas of Christianity. But if you ask them, did Jesus die upon the cross, placed in that grave, Joseph of Arimathea, and then did he bodily re be raised from the dead? No, they don't believe that. They believe that he would still be in the grave. His ideas and his thoughts were resurrected by the apostles, they would say. That's the modernist of our day. So we still have these who, who would teach and do teach. There is no future resurrection. In fact, if that be true, this life is all that there is. But such a thought makes Christ's death vain. Christ died in part to guarantee a resurrection. Jesus would state in John the 11th chapter verse 25 that I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. What is it? I'm going to die in order to assure a resurrection. I am that resurrection. And so, even if you die, you have hope. There's something to look forward to. In Colossians, the first chapter, in verse 18, Paul would say concerning Christ that He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. The word beginning there is a word which literally has reference to the, that which is the causative effect. That which causes everything else. Not that he had a beginning as Jehovah's Witness would teach. And they're not Jehovah's Witnesses. They're Russell's Witnesses. He's the causative force of everything. And then he says, the firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have the preeminence. He's the firstborn from the... But wait, as I read through the Old Testament, for example, I read of individuals who were raised from the dead before Jesus was. And I even read where Jesus raised individuals from the dead. How was He the firstborn thus from the dead? It's dealing not with first as far as time is concerned, but instead of first as far as priority is concerned. That His death enables everyone, or His being firstborn from the dead, His resurrection from the dead, enables others to be raised from the dead. There would be no resurrection if He were not raised. And thus He is the firstborn because there's a priority there that no one could be raised from the dead if He had not been raised from the dead. In 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, Paul deals with this to a great extent. In the first four verses, Paul sets forth the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which, uh, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I deliver unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And so here He is, that Gospel. What is it? Not only that Christ died for our sins, but that He was buried and that He rose from the grave. Why is that resurrection important? Because if He only died, then everything is worthless. He's not the Savior. He could not be the Savior. He was proved to be the, re the Son of God by the resurrection, Romans 1 and verse 4. Thus, everything would be worthless as far as Christianity. There would be no Christianity if there was not a resurrection from the dead. 
the major difference between Christianity and all of these other Oriental religions, like Mohammedism and such, is that they serve a dead prophet, we serve a risen Lord. Christ was raised from the dead. That grave was empty. And if it wasn't, then we need to go home and forget about everything. But now then, from that aspect of the Gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, he goes on to establish the results of that Gospel. We're not going to read the entire chapter, although it would be a profitable study. I don't have the time this morning. But look at a couple of verses. Verse 20. He says, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. The idea of sleeping. There is the sleeping that we would do during the night, but also that is a term that is used for death. Here Paul is saying Christ was raised from the dead, and He has become the first fruits. What's the first fruits? That's the guarantee of additional fruit. This is the first part of the harvest with the promise of more to follow, as it's being used here at least. And thus, Christ is the very first one with the promise of others to follow. The first fruits of them that slept. So others who now have passed on and are dead now, they have the promise that they will be raised from the dead because Christ was. Skip down to verse 23. Again, he emphasizes this same aspect. But every man in his order. Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Christ is the first fruits with the promise of more. Afterwards, at Christ's coming, they're going to be raised as well. But without a resurrection from the dead, there was no reason for Christ to die. If this world is all that we have, if there's no afterlife, there's you know, a song by, uh, I don't know if it's the Beatles or just John Lennon years ago, Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven. Imagine there's no hell. If that were the case, then there's nothing to live for. And there's no reason for Christ to die because this life is all that is. And we might as well do whatever we can while we can because once we die, we're like the dog, rover, dead all over. And there's nothing else that's important. We might as well as... The Scriptures say, eat and drink, and I'll add, be merry, for tomorrow you die. If there is no resurrection, Christ died in vain. There was no be no salvation to anyone. But then one last point. If I am lost, then Christ died in vain. Even though there's many today who essentially believe, even though they might not advocate, the doctrine of uh, universalism. That everyone will be saved. The, Bi the Bible teaches clearly that that's not the case. The Bible teaches that not just a few individuals will be lost, or that just some individuals will be lost. Listen to Jesus as he would state in Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 13 and verse 14. To enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in therein. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Jesus clearly teaches that the many are on that way to destruction. The few 
on the way to eternal life. And so while man might think, oh, the majority of people are going to be saved, or everyone is going to be saved, and if you talk to a lot of many uh, or a lot of people in the religious world today and ask them, do you know anyone who's going to be lost? Well, um, and they'll stammer around and stutter for a while. They don't really think of anyone being lost. But Jesus says the majority of people are lost. That the majority of people are Christ is going to come in flaming fire taking vengeance upon them. He puts out, or that he states that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they're going to be punished with an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. The majority of people will be lost. Whose fault is it? Well, it's not God's fault. Not God's fault that anyone's going to be lost. Even in spite of what those who believe in predestination as is commonly taught by man believe and teach. That God's responsible for all those individuals that are going to be lost. That's not the case. Paul would write in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4 that God is not willing that any should perish. Or uh, that God will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. In St. Peter the third chapter in verse 9, he tells us that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to be lost. That's not His will. God's will is that everyone be saved. And to that extent, Christ was sent to this world to die for us. John 3 and verse 16, the golden text of the Bible, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We don't have to die. God made a way for us to be saved. Paul would write in Romans 5th chapter and verse 8 that God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it's not God's fault that we're going to be lost. It's not Christ's fault that we're going to be lost. Remember again that gospel that Paul preached, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 and verse 2. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye receive, wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in me. And he tells us what that gospel is. It's that gospel that saves us. God established a way of salvation. It's through the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is it? That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. One of the great lies that Satan has perpetrated upon mankind, and I think sometimes upon those within the church, is that God is some type of a, a monster sitting up here in heaven and looking down at man just waiting for man to make a mistake so He can slap him upside the head and send him on into hell. What an abject lie of God. God's desire is for man to be saved. And to that end, He would, yes, give His Son to die upon that cross so that I can escape that eternal torment of, of hell fire and I can spend an eternity with Him. So as we read a while ago from Hebrews 2 and verse 9, we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. God sent His Son to die upon the cross to save sinful mankind, to save me, to save you. Christ came to this world. He lived among men. And yes, He died that cruel cross of Calvary so that we might be saved. If you look at 
for example, Philippians second chapter, verse six and verse seven, that here he was on an equality with God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. I believe Hebrews 12th chapter and verse 2 where he tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of the faith, who, and I think it could be rightly translated, instead of the joy that was set before him. What was the joy set before him? An eternal equality with the Father. But instead of that joy, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Christ left that equality with the Father to come to this world and yes, to suffer the death of the cross. Why? So that you can be saved. So that I can be saved. Now then, if, it's, if I'm lost, whose fault is it? It's not God's fault. It's not Christ's fault. He did... They did everything that they could to save me, to save you. They did everything that was necessary to bring about a reconciliation to God. If I'm lost, it's I'm lost because I choose to be. Because I failed to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I failed to live in obedience to the Word of God. Because I have rejected the blood that Jesus shed upon Calvary's tree. You remember the illustration that Brother Davidson used of this individual from Kansas? who had been tried and found guilty, but yet he was innocent. And finally, after spending years and just before his death, he was to be executed for the crimes that he did not commit. The governor of Kansas provided him a pardon. And he rejected the pardon. And they put him to death. God has extended the pardon to us. He's extended it to me. He's extended it to, to you in the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross. The blood that He shed there. If I say no, Christ died in vain for me. If you reject that pardon, that God has extended to you, then Christ's death will have been in vain for you. But He died for you. Will you accept the pardon that He offers? Will you accept that salvation that comes through the blood that He shed through His death? If you've not obeyed that Gospel of Jesus Christ, You've rejected His pardon. And Christ has died in vain for you. If you've not lived faithful as a child of God, then you're rejecting that pardon that God has set forth for you. Christ is dying in vain for you. But that blood is available for you to wash away your sins, to cleanse you from any unrighteousness if you will obey His Word. If you, upon your faith, will repent of your sins, make the confession of your faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son, and let us baptize you in water, you can have those sins washed away. You'll be being baptized into that death of Christ. His death will no longer be in vain for you. If you've become a child of God, but you've gone back into the world and its pollutions, and you realize that, yes, Christ has died in vain for your life now, why not come back into Him? And that blood is still available if we will but confess our sins. He's faithful and just, forgives us of our sins, cleanses us of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 and verse 9. If you need to come this morning, 
to accept that blood of Jesus Christ, to accept His death in your life, why not do so as we stand and sing this invitation song?